Welcome to Riverview Church. Man, it is so good to get to be together again and a huge welcome to you if you are new, you're joining us for the first time or maybe you're joining us for the first time in a long time. And man, it is really such a privilege to get to share with you this evening. And if we've never met, my name is Ryan and I'm a part of the team here. And I'm so excited tonight to get to continue our series simply titled Characters. And you see, throughout the months of August and September, we've been shining the spotlight on some uh, characters that we find throughout the biblical narrative. Now, whether they are well-known or they're obscure or they're strange, we genuinely believe that these characters can be a great source of inspiration as we play our part in living out and being a part of the greatest story ever told. Now, so far... On our journey, we've been greatly inspired by our characters. We've talked about the courageous Apostle Paul. We've talked about uh, the faith-filled Canaanite woman. We've talked about Daniel. We've talked about Joseph. And hopefully, and our prayer is that you walked away feeling inspired. But today, we're gonna take a little bit of a different tact. And we're gonna have a conversation about a key biblical character who comes along with a great deal of complexity and controversy. And because of that complexity and that controversy, I think often we've actually avoided talking about him altogether. And that has actually created maybe a greater misunderstanding. And I'm talking about, of course, none other than the devil. Why don't you just give a little boo? Just get it out of your system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, of course, topics like this can create a great deal of unrest. And you might be sitting there feeling a little uncomfortable thinking, why on earth or in hell are we spending, yeah, I'll give you that one, spending a Sunday talking about the devil? Why, why are we doing that? Now, whether you like talking about it or not, you have to agree that the devil is a key character in the biblical narrative. And if we are to truly understand the story of Scripture, if we are to truly understand the depth of the cross of Calvary, we need to understand the enemy in which we face. So we can avoid talking about it altogether and just skip over those passages of Scripture, or we can embrace the conversation, and I hope be better off for doing so. Now, besides, I'm a big sports fan, and any sports coach will tell you that if you wanna be on the winning side, what do you need to do? Know your opposition, right? Being on the winning side, a huge part of that is knowing the strategy of your opposition. So this, this evening, we are gonna go there. We're gonna go there. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time teaching. And my prayer today is that God's word would, to, uh, would reframe the way that we think. And as our minds are reframed and renewed, we would live life with a new sense of joy. We would live life with a new sense of freedom and hope. And we would understand the authority that we carry as Jesus' people. Now, before we begin, I also just want to put the disclaimer out there that by nature of a 30-minute talk, I cannot cover everything. And I know there's some, like, devil fans, you know, not devil fans, but, you know, people that love talking about this topic. And they're like, oh, you're going to mention that reference in uh, wherever it is? No, probably not. I've got 30 minutes, so I'm gonna do my best to give us a, 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 an overview of the devil, uh, but I'm not gonna be able to cover every single reference. And uh, I, I guarantee that along the way, I might say some things that challenge your assumption, that challenge your outlook, that challenge the way you see faith and life and maybe evil. But I'd encourage you this evening to lean into that stretch and that challenge. And if you really, really disagree, if you really disagree and you walk away and you just need to get it off your chest, feel free to reach out to me by email and email me at zach.gagler at riverviewchurch.com.au if you want to have a conversation about it. Now, in this room, if you weren't laughing at that, come to church more often. In this room, our understanding of the devil is no doubt greatly varied. You see, our understanding of God has come through the revelation of His Word and our shared faith life together. But the reality is our understanding of the devil, I think, has been more likely shaped by pop culture, by The Simpsons, or ACDC, or extracts from Greek mythology. You see, throughout the Scriptures, this evil figure, the devil, 
is presented as a creature in a state of rebellion against God's good plan. A creature in a state of rebellion against God's good plan. Now, this creature appears with many different, uh, throughout the biblical narrative in many different ways and with many different names. But contrary to popular belief, he doesn't show up as a little red horned trident holding humanoid. Now, that might have burst your bubble, but that's most likely, well, I don't know. I don't think that's what the devil looks like. That's our own depiction of him. You see, we're first introduced to this rebellious creature as a serpent in Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden. We witness this stunning exchange between humanity and the serpent. And this crafty serpent slithers up to Eve and he says, did God really say? And he begins to twist the very word and the very plan of God. And as we read through the scriptures, we find him reappearing with many different names and with many different personas. We, we witness him in Chronicles and Job as Satan. He's referred to elsewhere as Beelzebul, as the tempter, as the evil one, and then more commonly in our New Testament as the devil. Now, it's important to mention that these aren't so much names as they are titles. You see, Satan isn't a name, it's a title. In fact, in Hebrew, it has a prefix of the before it. It is the Satan, which means the adversary. And similarly, in the Greek, the devil means the slanderer. So these aren't necessarily names, but they are titles. So whoever and whatever this creature is, it's clear that he's not our friend. And Jesus himself affirms that he is a real being and he is a very present enemy. Now, whilst Jesus doesn't tell us what he looks like, he does give us an insight into his character. Jesus in John 8, talking about the devil, says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So according to Jesus, the devil is a liar. According to Jesus, the devil is the adversary and the accuser of God's truth. Now, it needs to be said early on in this message that whilst the Scriptures portray the devil as being in direct opposition to God, he is not in equal standing with God. So whilst the scriptures might paint as the devil in, as being in direct opposition to God, it does not mean that he is on equal standing with God. Isaiah 45, 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. In other words, there is no one on God's level. Now the reality is when someone is no match for their opponent, they usually resort to alternative tactics. You see, when I was 11 years old, I began my wonderful basketball career playing for the West Bullets in New Lambton, New South Wales. And whilst I would love to tell you that this was the beginning of a promising career and my journey into LeBron James-ness, uh, rather it was a journey which would build in me great perseverance and resilience. As an 11-year-old, we played a game, uh, we played 17 games, and we lost 17 times. We were bad, but the problem is we were already in the lowest league. Now, we were so bad, and I just found out this recently at family dinner, we were so bad that my mum would drop me off out the front and she would wait in the car. She didn't want to come in and watch because we would just get humiliated by our opposition. Now, as a bunch of 11-year-olds, we understood that when we are no match for our opposition, we're going to resort to alternative tactics. So you know what we did. I'm sure you've done it when you've played and you haven't been good. We started stomping on feet, getting elbows in, doing the wet willy in the ear. Man, 11-year-olds were lining up for free throws and we're sledging them, trying to get in their head. Because when you're no match for the opposition, you need a result to alternative tactics. Uh, tactics. Now, 11-year-olds understood this. But the point is, the devil is a dirty player. You see, the devil is no match for the powers of King Jesus, so he resorts to dirty war. 
He doesn't come against humanity with a stick. He doesn't come against humanity with a disease or an airstrike. He comes against humanity with a lie, a distorted idea. You see, the devil is not interested in controlling territory. He is interested in controlling the narrative, controlling the way you think, the way you see the world. You know, we've all seen more recently fake news. We are in a war for truth, and the devil is playing games. In fact, the devil is on a worldwide disinformation campaign. You see, dis disinformation is false information spread deliberately to deceive. And this is the tactic of the devil, to deceive you. Now, it's very simple, and it's very one-dimensional, but unfortunately, it is extremely effective. And it is the same tactic he's used from the very beginning. You see, if he can deceive you well enough, if he can sow enough lies or discouragement or doubt into your life, eventually he will begin to distort the way you see the world. And if you live with a distorted view of reality for long enough, you'll end up destroying yourself or even worse, those around you. You see, the devil is out to deceive, to deceive, to distort, to distort, to destroy. You see, destruction isn't the first ploy of the enemy. He's out to deceive you, and inevitably you'll end up destroying yourself. You see, if the devil could convince, let's say, an ostrich that it's an albatross, if it can sow enough lies into this ostrich's head that it's an albatross, and this ostrich walks around with a distorted view of reality enough, man, when something happens, it's gonna run straight off a cliff thinking it can fly. In the same way that if the devil can convince you that you are not good enough, and he keeps telling you that lie again and again, eventually it'll distort the way you see yourself. Eventually it'll distort the way you see your chances of getting that promotion, or the way you see yourself in that relationship or the way you hold your insecurities. And inevitably, those things will end up destroying your life and stopping you from living life to the full. And it all started with a lie. So I, um, imagine uh, a fly in a china shop, right? It's flying around, buzzing around, landing on teacups, teapots, little plates. Can't do much damage, right? It can do whatever it wants to try and damage the place, but it can't do anything. But a fly in the ear of a bull, well, that can do a huge amount of damage, right? And that is what the devil is about. Why would he need to lay a finger on you if he can get in your ear and get you to destroy your own life? You see, he is a liar and he speaks the same language today as he did in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? Did God really say that you have potential? Did God really say that you are forgiven and set free? Could God really use someone who doubts as much as you? And friends, tonight I wanna ask the question, what lies and deceit have you come to believe? What lies and deceit have you come to believe? And how have those lies began to distort the way you view God's good plan? Now the truth of the matter is, the devil is not the only enemy that we face. There's an, a brilliant 13th century theologian by the name of Thomas Aquinas who considered the enemy of our soul to be a threefold source. He considered the enemy to be the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, by the world, he means the societal pressures and indifference to God's good plan embracing empty and fleeting values and, and uh, offered to us by the world, things like popularity and wealth and, and conformity. And by the flesh, he means the temptations and the disordered desires of our own flesh that are in direct opposition with God's intention. You know, wickedness, selfishness, lust, and even a lack of self-control. And by the devil, well, we are talking about our real personal enemy, the father of lies, who with the fellow demons of hell is out to disinform us about the realities and the purposes of God, to deceive and twist us away from salvation and life eternal. 
Now, you might be sitting there wondering, well, Ryan, why are we mentioning these other guys? We're talking about the devil today. Well, I mention these other enemies because I think as Christians, often we have been guilty of blaming the devil for all of our problems. Hey, I know, we all have a devil-blaming friend, right? You know, you're out trying to find a car park at the shops, and it's been more than 20 minutes, and your friend starts going, oh, man, the devil's out to get me today. No, he's not. You just can't find a car park. Or when there's that extra donut there, and they go and eat that extra donut, and they go, man, it was the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. You see, when I'm sitting at home waiting for uh, Renee to come home from a catch-up, and I start to get hungry, and I look in the cupboard, and I see my beloved thin salt and vinegar chips. Hallelujah. When I see them up there, and then 10 minutes later, they're gone, and I'm sitting on the couch in my own sin and filth, covered in crumbs, and not the crumbs that Aaron was talking about. That was not the devil. That was the disordered desires of my own flesh and my own inability to take self-control. You see, when my uh, fridge breaks down, which it has been a little bit, when it breaks down and all the food goes off and, you know, we have to go and buy new food, that was not the devil. That was the fact that Daewoo are a poor fridge manufacturer (laughs) And that we got our fridge on the side of the road. (laughs) And when you're out for drinks with friends after work on a Friday evening, and you have more drinks than you know you should, don't go blaming that on the devil. That is you just being controlled by the, the conformity of the world around you. Friends, what I'm saying is do not give the devil credit where credit is not due. Now, I, hear me, I am not saying that the devil won't leverage those things to grab a foothold in your life, because he will. So when I eat another packet of thin salt and vinegar chips, which I'm sure will happen, Renee, sorry. When I do that again, I'm sure that he'll begin to whisper in my ear and say, hey, you have no control over your own flesh. So watch out for that. But do not give the devil credit where credit is not due. Because when you do that, you give him power and authority over you that he does not have. Do not give him power and authority over you that he does not have. You have control over your flesh as you walk by the Spirit. You have control over the pressures of the world as you walk by the Spirit. So take responsibility for that. Don't blame it on the devil because you are giving power and authority he does not have. You see, we face pressures and temptations and deception from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, are you ready this evening for the good news? Well, someone's excited. Well, praise be to God, because through Jesus Christ, we have achieved victory. Colossians 2, 13, it says this, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision or the brokenness of your own flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them at the cross. Come on, can I get an amen this evening? You see, that is good news today. It's good news for every single person sitting in here and for every single person out there that because of Jesus, we stand in victory Because of Jesus, we stand in victory. Now, recognize that it didn't just say he disarmed the powers of evil. He made a public spectacle of them. I don't know if you've ever played sport and you've said that I made a public spectacle of someone. That is humiliating them. That is doing a victory dance in the end zone, doing a celebration at the end. He humiliated the powers of evil. Now, the problem is, and you know this to be true, Sometimes it is hard to reconcile that victory in the world in which we live. You see, if Christ has disarmed the powers of evil, if Christ has triumphed over the devil at the cross, why is the enemy still a threat? 
Why does darkness and evil still manifest itself in our world? And why is there still rebellion against God's good plan? Well, the challenge is there is a difference between victory achieved and victory established. You see, on Tuesday, the 6th of June, 1944, Allied troops stormed the beach in Normandy in World War II. This was codenamed Operation Neptune, but more commonly referred to as D-Day. This was the largest seaborne invasion in human history, and this was the day that victory was won for the Allied troops. In one decisive blow, they, they uh, took back the Nazi regime and Hitler, and they knew that they had been disarmed. Now, the interesting thing is, there was still a huge amount to be done. And it wasn't until the 8th of May, 1945, that the war was considered over. And this was known as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. So there was considerable time between victory achieved and the establishment of the new and restored world. You see, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is like D-Day. It was the day in which victory was won, the decisive blow to the devil and the powers of evil. But friends, you see, we are still waiting, awaiting VE Day. Victory has been achieved, and because of that great victory, we see glimpses of the new kingdom, but the reality is we are still awaiting the return of the king. Now, here's the crazy thing, right? Between D-Day and VE Day, thousands and thousands of people still lost their lives. Even though victory was achieved, battles broke out, irreversible damage was done, people lost their lives, skirmishes broke out, battles for life and death, even though victory had been achieved. And you see, that's so much like the position that we find ourselves in, living in this now but not yet reality, in between victory achieved and victory established. So the question is, how do we live in between? How are we to deal with the powers of evil and darkness that are still present in the world? Well, the Apostle Paul, to uh, the letter in the church uh, in Ephesus, he writes this, Ephesians 6, 10, finally, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against humanity. But it is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. So how are we to live in light of the victory that Christ Jesus has achieved? We are to stand firm. You see, you don't need to do anything. You just need to stand in the victory that Christ has already won. The devil has been disarmed and he has no power over you. So stand your ground. Imagine it like this. The the devil is holding up a gun, right? Now, because of Jesus, you know that the bullets to that gun have been removed. Now, the devil is still gonna hold up his gun and he's still gonna walk around holding it to your head because if he knows, if he can just convince you that there's bullets in that gun, well, he has power over you. But by the cross, the bullets have been removed. You have been set free. So it is time to stand your ground. Now, you see, Jesus hasn't just given us authority to stand our ground, but he's given us authority to advance to bring about and establish his kingdom realities in a world that is decimated by darkness. So as we stand firm in victory achieved, how do we establish his victory? How do we carry forward his kingdom? Well, friends, we do that with sword in hand. Now, of course, I'm not talking about a real literal sword. Please don't bring one of those to church. 
I am referring to the Word of God. And in Ephesians 6, Paul beautifully lists all of the armor of God. He talks about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the shoes of the gospel of readiness or the gospel of peace. And then he lists one offensive item. So he lists all of these things in order that we might stand firm. And he lists one thing in which we are to wield, to advance and to fight back at the powers of evil. It says in Ephesians 6, 17, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You see, God's Word is powerful. God's Word is potent. It is prophetic and it is prevailing. Now, we are not just talking about words on a page in the Bible. We are talking about God's very Word, God's very action in humanity. Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the Word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. You see, the Word of God is powerful and the Word of God is true. Think, Think about this. What God says is. That's what creation is. What God says is. And so His Word will distinguish lies, deception, and temptation. And incredibly, God's Word by His Spirit begins to transform us from the inside out. Now, this is an incredibly powerful weapon. So we need to be good stewards of this great gift. And in the wise words of Uncle Ben, with great power comes what? All the young people, great responsibility. So if we are to advance well, With sword in hand, it is important first and foremost that we know what it is we're holding. You need to know the sword in your hand. You need to know the Word of God. You need to know its weight, its depth, its reach. You need to know what it has to say about certain subjects. Now, are you ready for a a slightly disturbing reality this evening? As we read through the Scriptures, it becomes evident that the devil knows the Word of God. So I want to ask you tonight, how well do you know the Word of God? Because I have no doubts the devil will begin to twist God's very Word to try and trick you, to try and deceive you. So you need to know what it is you're holding. Not only do you need to know your sword, you need to carry it with you everywhere you go, into every situation that you face. Now it's one thing to carry the Word of God in your hand, it's another thing to carry it on your heart. You need these truths to get inside here. You need God's truth, God's reality to become your reality. Now, of course, when you know your sword and you carry your sword, when lies come, when deception comes, what's it time to do? Swing your sword. Swing your sword. You see, when the temptations and the pressures of the world, when culture around us worships popularity, fame, relevance, power, Man, it's time to hold up the truth of God and swing His Word. When you're facing the disordered desires of your own flesh, when you're facing lust and you want to go on that website that you know you shouldn't, or you're wanting to to self-preserve by gossiping, man, it is time to swing the sword. And hey, when the devil slithers up to you and says, did God really say? Man, it's time to swing your sword. You see, when temptation and lies come at you, it's not the time to start opening your Bible and and finding out what it says. It's time to swing and proclaim the truth. So you need to be prepared. That's what this armor of God is about. It's about getting equipped to face, to stand firm, and to swing the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 